I'm going to go slightly beyond my brief here. I'm taking a risk, but I'm happy to take this risk, uh, by um, offering a, a word to students. May I just say that the more I have contact with your lecturers, the more I give thanks to God for, uh, for them, for their quality, uh, for their scriptural faithfulness, uh, for their gospel-centeredness, and I rejoice on your behalf for the privilege that you have of being taught by them. Uh, let me encourage you to pray for them, not to underestimate the intensity of the spiritual battle that they face, to be on your knees uh, for them, for their spiritual protection, for their marriages, for their raising of children, uh, for uh, their preparing of lectures, for their external ministries, uh, for their handling of very considerable pressures uh, in many cases. And may they continue to be outstanding models of personal godliness. Please do not take for granted uh, the privileges that you have in those regards. End of exhortation. Back to the annual Moore College Lectures for 2018. And we start, thank you very much for the, for the water, um, we start with um, a few questions that have been um, put to me uh, yesterday. Uh, first of all, just to finish off or to um, perpetuate a little uh, the discussion with regard to Psalm 51, uh, you recall the uh, questioner uh, asking about the um, last two verses of Psalm 51. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, um, possibly suggesting um, a post-exilic uh, uh, redaction at that point. Uh, I, I did ch check out one of my favorite commentators, a man called Philip Everson, uh, and he says this. Uh, I mention it simply because it, it's one of the options that hasn't yet been aired, either uh, publicly or in the more private discussions that uh, uh, were held uh, yesterday. Um, building up the walls of Jerusalem, says Philip Everson, is a poetic way of asking for the security and prosperity of the city and its people. Well, there's another option that you may like to consider. Quite a number of folk are asking about my take on Salter Shape, uh, which is not exactly our topic, but it is closely related to our topic. And I would refer you to my School of Theology paper from 2012, um, published in uh, the book edited by Andrew Sheed, entitled uh, Stirred by a Noble Theme. Um, and there's the advantage that that is quite a succinct article. You could read it uh, reasonably quickly, and it would, it would feed into the material from this week, uh, but it's not directly on topic. <coughs> Dr. Bray asked about um, how uh, shaping of the Psalter has been viewed uh, in the past, uh, and I said that I'd come back with a few words from Stephen Jenkins. Uh, here are just a few. Um, the idea that Psalm 1 introduces the Psalter is ancient. Hippolytus is the earliest source. Uh, Origins commentary set this in stone for all who followed, such as Jerome and most explicitly Basil. Basil's younger brother Gregory of Nyssa was the first to treat the Psalter as a unity. Um, and he goes on, just an amusing uh, quote, Augustine wrestled with the structure of the Psalter, certain that it was pur purposeful, but humbly confessed defeat. The arrangement of the Psalms, he said, which seems to me to contain the secret of a mighty mystery, hath not yet been revealed unto me. <laughs> um, well, there's lots more that, that could be said on that. And um, given that I know that you're francophone, the uh, material that I benefited from when I was looking into this some time back is from... Uh, a book by Jean-Marie Auers. Uh, there are other francophones in the, in the room as well, so you might want to take note. A-U-W-E-R-S, La Structure Littéraire du Psautier. Uh, and the, the, the early part of that uh, contains some helpful information along those lines. Um, question, could you please clarify from both the first and second lecture what exactly you underlined mean by Old Covenant, and where do you establish this from? 
2 Corinthians 3 or Hebrews or Jeremiah 31? And how necessary is this for your understanding of how the Davidic and Old Covenants relate, as well as new, as well as how the Davidic and New Covenants uh, relate? I'm not sure I have been talking about the Old Covenant as, as such as yet. I may well have been reporting what others have said uh, in this connection and for what others have said, you need to look at each specific case as to how they define it. But since I've been asked the question, what do I mean by Old Covenant? If, if I were to start talking about the Old Covenant, what would I mean by that? I would mean what the Bible means by the Old Covenant, <laughs> humbly, <laughs> namely the Sinaitic Covenant. And for that, I do indeed refer you to Jeremiah 31, verse 32. And if you need convincing from that text, I uh, invite you to do the work in Jeremiah 11, which is in the background there. Uh, and then Hebrews 8, verse 6, and 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14. But actually, we're getting ahead of ourselves there. Two questions on Psalm 2, verse 12. Uh, first, are you arguing that Psalm 2, like Isaiah 55, verse 3, envisages a covenant made with you, plural. Somebody very helpfully told me yesterday that in Australian vernacular, one can say yous, <laughs> which is a useful way of disambiguating um, uh, what in the Queen's English is um, a, a bit of a problem in communication. <laughs> um, so um, are you arguing that Psalm 2, like Isaiah 53, ver 55 verse 3, envisages a covenant made with yous? or simply that those who take refuge in the Son are the beneficiaries of God's covenant with the King? Uh, the answer, the former, but uh, if you can uh, persuade me that there are Davidic covenant passages that speak clearly of, the benef of beneficiaries other than David, uh, then I could end up saying that it's both. And then secondly, on what basis do you Dear, your reading of Psalm 2's last line away from Psalm 1 and the blessed Israelite who medit uh, meditates on the Torah of the Lord and walks in the derek of the righteous. Um, I understand the thrust of the question, the inclusio uh, between Psalm 1 verse 1 and Psalm 2 verse 12, the uh, blessed. Um, I take it that in Psalm 2, uh, all who take refuge uh, in the Son are, are blessed, and uh, although I did argue that faithful Israelites are included in that, uh, it's broader than that. I take it that those who are addressed in verse 10 of Psalm 2 uh, can also enjoy that security spoken of in verse 12. Question, how expectant was David et al., of a new covenant. Did they speak better than they knew, or is it only the redactor or redactors who assembled in the light of Jeremiah who had new covenant expectancy? Um, an excellent question. I'm presupposing uh, the Psalter and a post-exilic date for the Psalter, uh, but I refer you to uh, Acts 2's commentary on Psalm 16. Um, so, um, Acts 2, verses 29 and following. Uh, this is uh, Peter, isn't it, on the day of Pentecost? Brothers, I may say uh, to you with confidence, Acts 2, verse 29, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. But I also refer you to uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12. Uh, the prophets were hazy on the person, there's a bit of a debate, is it the person and the circumstances, or is it the time and the circumstances? I would uh, 
favor the ESV person and circumstances, that they spoke, when they spoke of the sufferings and the, of Christ and the glory, glories that would follow, um, uh, there was a, uh, a haziness uh, there that uh, means that we, in our era of redemptive history, are privileged uh, when it comes to um, revelation. And I think that covers the uh, questions that have been submitted um, in that uh, form. Um, please keep the questions coming. Thank you very much for the interaction. Um, please keep telling me, whether publicly or privately, I don't feel particularly precious about this material, uh, but please keep telling me where you're not finding it persuasive. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, yeah, your job is to act as noble Bereans and to, uh, to, to correct me, please. So again, I'm assuming that people do have access to uh, the handout, and uh, and uh, that that's for. Sorry, is there somebody who who doesn't have it? Thank you. So, we're now into book four, and I'm gonna take you to the end of book four to start with Psalm 106, verse 47. Book four closes with a prayer. Save us, Yahweh, our God, and gather us from the nations so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. There is something of a debate here which concerns the relationship of this passage with 1 Chronicles 16, which I uh, am choosing to skip over now. Um, again, um, if you would like me to go into that, I'd be delighted to. I've got uh, lots of material that I could uh, uh, offload onto you, uh, should that be of interest. Um, Suffice it to say that this prayer is found on the lips of those in exile in Babylonia. And with that prayer on the lips of the exiles at the end of book four, the reader of the Psalter is probably slightly further on in history than at the end of book three. In Psalm 89, it would seem that the psalmist is voicing a fairly immediate reaction to the events of 586 BC. Uh, you can check that, in, check that out in Psalm 89, um, verses 40b to 46. That may be the, um, uh, the Hebrew versification. Forgive me for that. I've, I'm under instruction just to give the English, um, and I might just say um, this is not a matter of discrimination against um, uh, the Hebraists in the room, but you will have to make uh, an adjustment um, where the Psalms require that. Sorry about that. It is a, it's a real pain, isn't it, when there's a, a, a difference of uh, uh, verse numbering as between Hebrew and English. Um, let's get back on track. Um, it would seem that the psalmist, <coughs> in, uh, at the end of Psalm 89, is voicing a fairly immediate reaction to the events of 586 BC, whereas in Psalm 106, verse 47, the exiles pray for restoration to their land. But if we set aside this verse and the one that precedes it, uh, book four amounts to a flashback. The historical progression through the era of David in books one and two, uh, Solomon, book two, and the exile of the two kingdoms in book three is interrupted and gives way to what John Walton calls, by way of a heading, introspection about destruction of temple and exile. The calamity of the exile engenders theological reflection, and a whole book is given over to it. I believe that Gerald Wilson is justified in calling these 17 Psalms the editorial center of the final form of the Hebrew Psalter. That this editorial concern is to respond to the crisis of Psalm 89 
is uncontroversial amongst those who engage in editorial criticism of the Psalter. Paradoxically, however, it's also uncontroversial these days to avoid embracing the particular solution that Wilson himself proposes, but we don't need to go into that. It's a consensus observation that book four is mosaic. Even John Goldingay, who is unenthusiastic about the study of Salter shape, gives some assent to Martin, uh, excuse me, Marvin Tate's label, Moses' book. But the mosaic character of the book needs to be unpacked, lest it prove misleading. In book four, we are exposed to all the occurrences bar one of the name Moses in the Psalter, the figure of Moses, his era, his five books, his psalm, Psalm 90, and his role as intercessor. Yet, at no point does book four appeal to the Mosaic covenant, the Sinaitic covenant, by way of solution to the problem of the exile. This absence is striking and it seems significant given one, the importance in book four of the Pentateuch as the source of the answer to the exile, and two, the prominence in this same fourth book of the theme of covenant. Indeed, one way of formulating the book's very aim could be this, and you have it on the handout, to highlight the unbreakable character of the Abrahamic covenant with a view to demonstrating that the Davidic covenant has not been annulled and that the new covenant will be realized. And our task in today's lecture and tomorrow's is to defend that thesis. Point two on the outline. Our starting point is to consider further what we began to explore uh, just a moment ago at the end of Psalm 106. In context, the prayer for restoration, verse 47, is tied to the fact of the captor's compassion, verse 46. This compassion is something that's given by Yahweh, the verb Natan, verse 46. The basis on which Yahweh bestows this gift on the exiles is his covenant. Verse 45, and he remembered his covenant with them and relented according to the greatness of his chesed in line with his loving covenant commitment. But which covenant is on view here? The question is important since this is a key verse the, the Psalms capstone writes Rolf Jacobson. It's this verse that explains why optimism regarding a return from exile, verse 47, is in fact realism, despite the Israelites' unfaithfulness, and why praise is the fitting mood for the psalm. Have a look at verse 1. Yet, there is something of a tradition of not identifying the covenant in question, and this has even been seen as a virtue. In rare cases, it's been suggested that the covenant is that of Sinai. But this seems to stem from an unfortunate conflation of, in the case of Erich Zenger, the person of Moses and the Mosaic covenant, or, in the case of Neil Richardson, conflation of the Sinai experience and the Sinai covenant. Adam Hensley, who incidentally has uh, written a doctoral dissertation uh, published, I think, just this year uh, on covenant relationships in the Psalter. Um, <clears throat> and I think he works in Adelaide. Um, I can check out his, um, where he teaches. Um, Adam Hensley uh, argues that the, quote, the psalm presupposes a seamless continuity between the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants and regards them as essentially one and the same. So Robert Brown has his uh, um, uh, antennae uh, 
twitching at, at the moment and is thinking, ooh, interesting from the perspective of Westminster covenantalism there. Has he not? Is he sitting in the same place uh, today? Uh, where, is, where is Rob? Ah, just there. You were intrigued by that, weren't you? Um, he says um, that it, 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 we're, we're in the business of, of one covenant of Yahweh established with Abraham and graciously sustained and renewed at Horeb. But when you read him, you see that he confuses mosaic covenantal context, that's his expression, with mosaic covenantal content, that's mine. To the extent, however, that one can speak of a consensus on this question of the identity of uh, the covenant here in verse uh, 45, it does lie with the Abrahamic covenant. And there are many reasons for asserting confidently that this is indeed the referent of my covenant in Psalm 106, verse 45. First, the data of the psalm itself, considered independently of Psalter context, point clearly in this direction. In verse 23, we read, So he said he would have destroyed them if Moses, his chosen one, had not stood before him in the breach to turn his wrath away from destroying them. In context, verses 19 and following, this refers to Moses' role as intercessor in the golden calf incident, first reported in Exodus 32. Exodus 32 is explicit regarding the key factor that gives rise to the turning away of Yahweh's wrath. It is on the basis of the promises to Abraham that Moses' prayer is answered. Here is how Moses argues. And so I'm just going to read Exodus 32, 11 to 14. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. But there is a second Pentateuchal text that reports the same incident and that's also in the background to Psalm 106, verse 23, namely Deuteronomy 9, verses 25 to 29. And whilst at first blush, these verses may appear not to add much to the Exodus 32 passage, brief consideration of their context will enable us to appreciate this. We need to view the Abrahamic covenant as being fundamental not only to the golden calf incident, but also to most of the other episodes that feature in the long Psalm 106. We're driven to this conclusion because the golden calf episode serves as the grid through which to interpret other major incidents in which the Israelites sin. And the way in which this is signaled in Deuteronomy 9 is via an interruption in the narrative. Verses 8 to 21 provide an account of the golden calf event in which Moses' role as intercessor is on view. As for the content of Moses praying, it's revealed only after a parenthetical section has been intercalated, verses 22 to 24 of Deuteronomy 9. When verse 25 resumes the account, it immediately does so in a way that clearly ties the narrative back to the golden calf episode, for it employs the same language of 40 days and 40 nights, which is already featured three times, verses 9, 11, and 18, as well as the formula, and I fell prostrate before Yahweh, recalling verse 18 directly. The usefulness of these observations turns on the way in which this narrative shapes our understanding of the material that is sandwiched between its two parts. The intercalated material, verses 20 to 24, is all of a piece with the golden calf incident. 
Thus, as we read, verse 22, and at Tabera, and at Massa, and at Kibroth Hatava, these other incidents need to be viewed as being under the same umbrella as the Golden Calf event. Likewise, the Kadesh Barnea episode, verse 23. All involve Israelite rebellion, verse 24, and all need to be understood as requiring the same response, namely intercession by Moses that's grounded in the Abrahamic promises. Of the four episodes to which verses 23 and 24 refer, refer uh, two occupy an important place in Psalm 106, Kibroth Hatava, uh, Numbers 11, and Kadesh Barnea, Numbers 13 and 14. A third, Massa, is tied by virtue of its place name and similar features to another episode in another location that's referred to in the psalm as taking place by the waters of Meribah. The Kadesh Barnea episode, which we've already touched on in relation to Deuteronomy 9, contains its own attestation of mosaic intercession that's similar to that of the golden calf incident. This is Numbers 14. Although in this instance he doesn't mention the patriarchs by name, Moses appeals to the Abrahamic promise concerning the land. Further, as he does so, he reminds Yahweh, this is Numbers 14, verse 18, of the words that Yahweh addressed to him in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And the latter text forms part of the golden calf narrative and underscores the Abrahamic connotations that we must associate with the key term chesed in these contexts. It's significant that aside from the oft-repeated formula of verse 1, the two occurrences of this key term in Psalm 106 are preceded by the, by the, na the noun rov, greatness, verse 7 and verse 45. Yahweh acts out of the greatness of his covenant loyalty, reminiscent of those original Pentateuchal texts which speak of Yahweh as being great of covenant loyalty, rav chesed. Two incidents of rebellion recorded in Psalm 106 remain unaccounted for in our discussion so far. It may appear that no clear Abrahamic covenant background may be claimed for them, but this would be mistaken. First, we should note that intercession, or at least intervention, plays an important part in both. In the case of Korah's rebellion, number 16, Moses and Aaron intercede on behalf of all the community, their prayer apparently answered by the fact that only Korah's people are put to death. In the second case, the Baal Peor incident, the intervention is that of Phinehas, grandson of Aaron, which gives rise to Yahweh's covenant of peace, a covenant of an everlasting priesthood, Numbers 25. We return to this covenant later in this double lecture, almost certainly tomorrow. Secondly, although it cannot be said of Phineas's intervention that it's explicitly grounded in the promises to Abraham, we come across another throwback to the patriarch in the Baal Peor incident as recorded in the psalm. Phineas's act, quotes, was counted to him as righteousness, language that clearly alludes to Abraham's believing Yahweh's promise regarding the number of his offspring, Genesis 15, verse 6. Thirdly, these two incidents are bound together with that of the golden calf by virtue of the paneling. There's a word that I learned from, from Barry Webb, um, who um, many of you will know uh, when I was here at, uh, as a student. Um, these two incidents are bound together with that of the golden calf by virtue of the paneling that the Pentateuch exhibits uh, several themes of the Sinai sojourn recurring both at Kadesh and in the plains of Moab. I don't know uh, whether your uh, Pentateuch lecturer um, uh, benefits from the, the Wenham diagram that shows the, um, the three sojourns and the three... Um, uh, um, sorry, I've got French coming to my head. Um, motions, movements, um, um, journeys... Um, uh, so, um, anyway, um, there are significant, um, there is significant panelling uh, if you compare the three subjects and compare the three journeys. Um, the propitiation of 
Uh, Exodus 32, uh, Sinai has as counterparts in Numbers 16, Kadesh uh, uh, has, as, ha, has counterparts in Numbers 16, that's Kadesh, and Numbers 25, that's Moab. So although the Baal Peor incident includes some, some characteristics that might make it look exceptional, it should be held together with other episodes where the Abrahamic covenant background is unquestionably in view. Now, you might think that that argument uh, suffices to establish uh, the fact that uh, Psalm 106, verse 45, uh, alludes to the Abrahamic covenant, and you would be right. But you would be wrong to think that I'm not going to continue with further arguments. (laughs) Other arguments that buttress what we've already seen. A second argument derives from the close ties between Psalms 105 and 106, which are well-established. Similarity of length, uh, overlapping of praise formulae, hodul adonai, hallelujah, sharing of key terms. I've got a, lot of, a number of them in my notes here. Proper nouns, Cain and Ham, and complementarity of theme. That Psalm 105 showcases Yahweh's faithfulness to his promises to Abraham is not, of course, adequate proof that those promises are still on view in Psalm 106, verse 45. But the twinning of the two Psalms requires that the Psalter reader reflect on how they're coordinated. And if the first celebrates Yahweh's unshakable commitment to the Abrahamic covenant, the second celebrates the fact that this same commitment remains inviolable, even in the face of serious, repeated sin. So Bernard Goss is not exaggerating when he speaks of a reminder of the theme of covenant in Psalm 106, verse 45, and of the, quote, total and voluntary absence of reference to that of Sinai in these Psalms. Further, he usefully draws attention to the link between the Abrahamic covenant and the gift of the land at the end of both Psalms. Hope that the prayer of Psalm 106, verse 47 will be answered is in line with Psalm 105, verses 42 to 45. A third reason why we can be confident that my covenant in Psalm 106 verse 45 is that of Abraham lies with the links between Psalms 90 and 106 at the extremities of the book. These two Psalms that frame book four grapple with the inveterate sin of the people, the divine wrath that that this provokes, and the question of whether divine chesed is exhausted. We contend that the intertextual dialogue between the two psalms is instructive. Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses, and we see Moses at prayer in Psalm 106. More specifically, the most explicit case of Mosaic intercession in Psalm 106, that of the golden calf episode, verse 23, is the one that fits the data of Psalm 90. Whilst it's true that commentators don't generally draw on the Exodus 32 incident to explain the circumstances underlying Psalm 90, this is partly owing to a refusal to see Moses as the author of the prayer. That said, it is widely recognized and highly significant that as the intercession begins in Psalm 90, verse 13, the language recalls Exodus 32, verses 12b to 13a. Return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants? Return, shuv, shuva, have pity, relent, vahinachem, and your servants all feature in that Exodus 32 text in which Moses calls out to Yahweh to remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and reminds him of his oaths. When, therefore, in the psalm, Moses immediately continues by asking to be satisfied with Yahweh's chesed, Psalm 90, verse 14. We readers are required to vest this term with Abrahamic connotations. Compare also Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, and our discussion of that already. Given the collocation of chesed and berit, covenant in Psalm 106 verse 45, the dialogue with Psalm 90 drives us to recognize once again that is the Abrahamic covenant that is alluded to at the end of book four. 
We're not maintaining that Exodus 32 to 34 is the only Pentateuchal passage in the background of Psalm 90. Even in Psalm 90 verse 13, which we've just considered, have pity on your servants also harks back to Deuteronomy 32 verse 36, where we learn that Yahweh will have pity on his servants. Does this Deuteronomy 32 text also suggest that the Abrahamic covenant is the basis for the intercession of Psalm 90 and Psalm 106? Indeed so. And it will lead us to spell out a fourth reason to be confident that Psalm 106 verse 45 bespeaks the promises to Abraham. But we shouldn't bypass a difficulty here, and an interesting difficulty, and an important one for questions of covenant relationships. Deuteronomy 32 forms part of a section of that fifth book of Moses in which another covenant is established in the plains of Moab. So this is Deuteronomy uh, 29, um, 1 uh, in English, uh, through to 32, uh, 52. Deuteronomy 29 to 32. This covenant is both distinct from and complementary to the Sinaitic covenant. Deuteronomy 29 verse 1, in addition to the covenant he made with them at Horeb. As this covenant is being set up, the Abrahamic promises are stressed. You stand today, all of you, I'm reading Deuteronomy 29, various verses. Um, you stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God is making with you today, in order that he may establish you today as his people and that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this Transjordanian covenant doesn't stray from the theology of the book of Deuteronomy as a whole, which is simultaneously Abrahamic and Sinaitic. Both this last book of the Pentateuch in general and this supplementary covenant in particular confirm, one, the gracious promises that Yahweh has made to Abraham, and two, the absolute necessity of keeping the Sinaitic commandments as a condition of blessing. I refer you to Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 to 20. What is new in this additional covenant of Deuteronomy 29 to 32, and especially in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 10, is the clarity with which the compatibility between these two strands is set forth. Here's the scenario with which the reader is presented in this section of Deuteronomy. The Israelites will prove guilty of breaking the covenant established at Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 31, verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. The curses of that Sinaitic covenant will fall on the people, including, notably, the exile. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. Deuteronomy 31, verse 21. But... This does not mean that there is no ultimate hope to which the people may cling. Deuteronomy 32, verse 36, and verse 39, and verse 43. The Abrahamic promises will come to be fulfilled eschatologically, beyond the peoples being scattered amongst the nations, as they repent, are brought back to the land, and enjoy blessing. Deuteronomy 30. Verses 1 to 5. Significantly, Yahweh will carry out an operation on the heart. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And you can um, have a look at Deuteronomy 29, verse 4 in that connection. Pierre Buisse explains. For the people of God, the death resulting from unfaithfulness is not an end. From there, it is possible to start again on the journey towards faithfulness and life. Beyond the exile, the contract will no longer be resumed under the same conditions. Yahweh will have circumcised the hearts of his people who will be able to live out the great demand of Deuteronomy. Love Yahweh your God with all your heart so that you may live. 
The book can even conclude with the prospect of Israel, I quote, in safety in a land of grain and wine, Deuteronomy 33, verse 28. Such is the future of this people that is happy and saved by Yahweh, Deuteronomy 33, verse 29. It appears that the reader can be confident of the ultimate realization of the Abrahamic promises. Yahweh's intervention to circumcise hearts is certainly a new and radical element in the progress of biblical revelation up to this point. As the Pentateuch draws to a close, the mystery implied by the apparently competing Abrahamic and Sinaitic strands comes to be unraveled to a considerable extent. The Abrahamic promises will not be under threat when the Sinaitic covenant curses fall. And ultimately, heart circumcision will even obviate the need for further cursing. But we shouldn't exaggerate the explanatory power of this Transjordanian covenant. Moses has already insisted upon the ongoing validity of the Abrahamic covenant in the face of the exile. Both in his first speech in Deuteronomy, that's Deuteronomy 4, verses 25 to 31. You have that on the hand that I hope. Yes. Uh, and also back in Leviticus 26. If in the event of exile, the people repent, I read Leviticus 26, verses 42 and following, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. But the land shall be abandoned by them and enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them, and they shall make amends for their iniquity, because they spurned my rules and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet for all that, when they're in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them, neither will I abhor them so as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sake remember the covenant with their forefathers whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So it's by virtue of his covenant with Jacob, his covenant with Isaac, and his covenant with Abraham that Yahweh will remember the land. Verse 42, it's because this covenant constitutes a commitment to the descendants of these patriarchs, yes, the descendants of these patriarchs, that the total destruction of the people will not take place. Yahweh's covenant with them, verse 44, in other words, with the exiles, yes, with the exiles, you see, is unbreakable. It's thanks to the covenant with their forefathers that the survivors will benefit, verse 45, for their sake from divine intervention such as, ha as had previously given rise to the exodus from Egypt. This is precisely the scenario that is in prospect at the end of Psalm 106. The exile's supplication of verse 47 regarding a return to the land is based on the solid foundation of the promises to Abraham. Roman 3. The question arises as to why the Abrahamic covenant solution to the exile's problem presented in the Psalms that frame Book 4, as we've just seen, is an appropriate response, given that the preoccupation of Psalm 89 turns on the apparent failure of the Davidic covenant. Well, if you were able to follow yesterday, <laughs> the reader of the Psalter is uh, already clear on the answer provided by the end of book two. We did note yesterday from Psalm 72, verse 17b in particular, that fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant comes via the Solomonic king, who is the fruit of the Davidic covenant. We saw that this occurs within the framework of new covenant realization. This means that at the point of fulfillment, the Abrahamic covenant must entail the Davidic covenant. The perspective of book four is no different. But here in book four, we benefit from greater clarity. 
in keeping with the progressive nature of the revelation that the Psalter evinces. And we benefit, too, from greater detail. From the outset, on reading Psalm 90, this is the um, uh, subheading, Abrahamic solution to be applied to the exile. From the uh, outset, on reading Psalm 90, the Psalter reader is given an immediate clue as to the apposite character of Book 4's answer to the crisis of Book 3. This comes in the form of the striking intertextuality between the end of Psalm 89 and Psalm 90. Whilst it would be an error to downplay the caesura that divides the two books, we shouldn't allow this division to blind us to the significant links between these two seam psalms. First... The author of Psalm 89 voices the same concerns as Psalm 90 regarding the brevity of life. Towards the end of the psalm, he cries out to Yahweh as follows. Remember how short my time is for what vanity you've created all the children of man. What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? It is, of course, true that Psalm 90 expresses these concerns in a more developed way, as we heard in the reading. But secondly, and conversely, if the last part of Psalm 89 is characterized by anguished pleading, we should observe that although this is not the dominant note sounded by Psalm 90, yet our key verses from that psalm would be perfectly at home in that Psalm 89 context. Um, So... Uh, reminder of, of uh, Psalm 89, how long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old? Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked. Compare with Psalm 90, verses 12 to 14. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. The symbiosis between the two psalms at these levels requires us to consider the connections between the respective problems that they set forth. If Psalm 89 laments the apparent collapse of the Davidic covenant that comes into play with the Babylonian exile, Psalm 90 laments the problems of sin and its consequences and does so in a way that clearly recalls Genesis 3. Indeed, whether or not one wants to speak of a covenant between uh, Yahweh and Adam, and I'm aware of the controversies uh, that surround that, uh, whether or not one wants to speak of a covenant between uh, Yahweh and Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adamic disobedience to the commandment of Genesis 2.17 lies in the background of the psalm. Genesis 2.17, the prohibition Uh, regarding eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That lies in the background of the psalm, the consequences of transgressing being extensively on view. After speaking of the act of creating the world with an allusion to Genesis 2 verse 4, that's in Psalm 90 verse 2, verse 3 recalls even more clearly uh, a Genesis background, Genesis 3 verse 19, and I've given that to you in that little uh, table there. Uh, You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it, for you are dust and you will return to dust. Psalm 90 verse 3, you return mankind to the dust, saying, return, descendants of Adam. Just for the sake of the Hebraeus, I am aware that the word for dust is not the same in those two texts, hence the fact that it's not highlighted. Despite, just, just, in, just in case you feared that I was overplaying my hand or something, um, despite uh, an allusion to the first man, Adam, uh, the emphasis in Psalm 90 verse 3 is placed on humanity as a whole. More generally, the full narrative underlies Psalm 90 verses 7 to 11 the exposing of Adam's sin, verse 8, and you've got the, um, relative, the, the, the relevant um, uh, passages in Genesis uh, that are connected to them in your notes. 
uh, so I don't have to um, uh, re repeat them. Um, the exposing of Adam's sin, verse 8, death as a consequence of sin, verses 8 and 9, uh, the trouble and sorrow of life, uh, 10b. Uh, given these echoes, it's reasonable to presuppose that the wrath of Yahweh, which is mentioned uh, five times in this part of the psalm, but not mentioned as such in the Genesis narrative, that this wrath lies at the root of the curses of Genesis 3, verses 14 to 24. In addition, it may well be that the thousand years of Psalm 90, verse 4, reflect Genesis 5. Following the sentence of Genesis 3 and prior to that of Genesis 6, verse 3, such is the approximate human lifespan. It's also possible that the use of zaram, the verb to flood, in the following verse recalls the following chapters of the Genesis narrative, the account of the flood, Genesis 6 to 9. The bottom line of the way in which Psalm 90 simultaneously attaches itself to Psalm 89 and reaffirms the theology of Genesis 3 is that we Psalter readers are driven to associate the problem of the exile, Psalm 89, with the problem of sin, Psalm 90. The nature of this association is not far to seek and has already emerged from book three. Sin is the very problem that led to the exile. The problem of divine wrath is a recurring motif in book three, and I've given you uh, references there on the handout. And Psalm 90 affords clarity regarding its close connection with sin. Even though the perspective on the Davidic covenant expressed in Psalm 89 is valid, there is more that needs to be said on this score if the psalmist's perplexity is to be alleviated. Sinful human behavior and the wrath that this provokes need to be taken into consideration within the framework of the Davidic covenant. At least from one camera angle, that covenant with David is conditional. The dynamic of the Sinaitic covenant Blessing conditional on obedience, cursing resulting from disobedience. Uh, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. Uh, this dynamic forms at least part of the formulation that one needs to give to the Davidic covenant if it is to be full orbed. Next uh, little subheading there. If Psalm 90 verses 3 to 11, enables the Psalter reader to grasp that the fundamental problem that needs to be remedied is that of Genesis 3, this seems to be confirmed at the other end of the book. Psalms 104 to 106 trace salvation history as it unfolds through the remainder of Genesis and of the Pentateuch. What emerges from these Psalms, as we'll see, are the building blocks for the solution to the problem of the fall. The same solution that's the subject of Moses' intercession in the last part of Psalm 90. The logic then of the way in which books three and four relate to one another is this. If Moses' pleading in Psalm 90 verses 12 to 17 is answered, the human sin leading to divine wrath problem will be resolved. And as a result, the problem of the exile will also be resolved. Expressed another way, finding a solution to the problem of the exile is not the absolute, primordial, radical imperative. But finding a solution to the problem of sin is that key imperative. Book four thus recalibrates the perplexing crisis of book three. To be sure, resolving the exile problem is necessary. But this will come about as an entailment of a more fundamental solution. This reading of the articulation between books three and four is further reinforced by what we've already discussed concerning the presenting problems in Psalms 90 and 106, which can be summarized as the golden calf sin problem. We've already demonstrated that the character of the solution to the Israelite sin is Abrahamic. This fits with the flow of the first book of scripture the solution to the problem of Genesis 3 to 11 finds its first sustained expression in the promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12. Our task at this juncture is to see uh, 
how Book 4 presents this Abrahamic solution in the three long psalms that close this short book and make up almost 40% of its content. I'm talking about Psalms 104, 105, 106. And I think I can uh, start this, so I think we'll aim to get to, um, we'll, we'll cover um, Roman 4 now and then pick it up uh, tomorrow, uh, God willing. Slightly easier to follow than yesterday. Uh, you're supposed to be nodding at this point, but... Um. <laughs> With the advent of the flood of Genesis 6 to 9, compare Psalm 90 verse 5, the survival of humanity and the world is at stake. Removing the threat of decreation is part of what's required to pave the way for the solution to the problem of Adamic sin. It's our contention that in the context of Book 4, one of the functions fulfilled by Psalm 104 is to point up the stability of the created order as guaranteed by the covenant with Noah, Genesis 8 and 9. Psalm 104 celebrates God's commitment to his creation. Several authors underline the parallels between this psalm and Genesis 1, but it's important to observe that there's, a, there's greater emphasis on Yahweh's ongoing acts of providence than on his initial act of creating the world. The section that concerns us most directly is that of verses 5 to 9, which speak of Yahweh's stabilizing of the creation, verse 5, it shall not be moved forever and ever. And Yahweh's control of the waters. Should this be understood from a pre-flood, initial creation, or a post-flood, Noah covenant perspective? The exegetical case for the pre-flood option is probably stronger. So it doesn't, it's not particularly convenient for me, if you like. Um, but we're only at the beginning of my uh, chat on this. Um, but I, want, I just want to be uh, absolutely uh, straight. The, it, the pre-flood option is, is probably stronger. Verse 5 speaks of the time when Yahweh established the earth on its foundations. And the majority of commentators discern in these verses only the poetic equivalent of Genesis 1, verses 9 and 10. But the possibility of allusions to the flood narrative shouldn't be dismissed too quickly, it seems to me. Consider verse 6, and you have that in the little table there. Uh, Psalm 104, verse 6, you covered it, that's the earth, with the deep as if it were a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. Genesis 7, then the waters surged even higher than the earth and all the mountains under the whole sky were covered. The mountains were covered as the waters surged above, above them more than 20 feet. In addition, consider verse 9 of the psalm. You set a boundary they cannot cross. They will never cover the earth again. It's difficult to read verse 9 and think only of Genesis 1, for the, water, the waters did cover the earth at the time of the flood. So even if one's persuaded that the allusion to the original creation is stronger or even exclusive, it's hard to ignore the flood as the elephant in the room. Accordingly, Philip Everson can assert that, quotes, there is nothing in the context to suggest that these particular verses are describing the account of the flood. But he feels compelled to discuss the flood at some length. Why? Well, notably, to explain what on this understanding is an exception. I quote him, only on that one occasion <laughs> did God allow the great deluge to happen. And I have other examples in a, in a footnote here. It may well be that we should understand 
Psalm 104, verse 9, to be recalling the covenant with Noah. That case can be built on these five factors. One, the major significance of this flood, of, of, of this flood event in the Genesis account as an overturning of creation. Two, the close parallels between initial creation and post-flood recreation. Three, the emphasis in the psalm on sustaining uh, God's sustaining of creation. Four, the fact that Psalm 104 presupposes not only the realities of Genesis 1 and 2, but also those of Genesis 3, since it speaks of sin and death, verses 29 and 35. And five, the way in which the succeeding psalms pick up the Pentateuchal narrative at Genesis 12 and again assume at least one chapter further on than Genesis 1 and 2. But I may be wrong. And if it's not correct, there's a sense in which verse 9 still needs to be construed as, so to speak, a proto-Noahic covenant or an expression of Yahweh's commitment to creation with regard to the danger of a whole earth flood. Either way, the Genesis 8 and 9 background provides a strikingly good fit for Psalm 104. There's an accent on regularity in both passages. Uh, I quote here Genesis 8 verse 22. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And you can compare that with Psalm 104 verses 19b to 23 and Psalm 104, verse 27. In Genesis 9, uh, Yahweh's commitment to creation, which you see in the psalm as well, is, is solemn. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read um, verses nine to 11 of Genesis 9. Understand that I'm confirming my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that's with you, birds, livestock, and all wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark. I confirm my covenant with you that never again will every creature be wiped out by the waters of the flood. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. Well, if you're familiar with some, if you're not familiar with Psalm 104, you can become familiar with Psalm 104 and, uh, and, and see, see what you think. Although uh, Conrad Schaefer is right to point out that Psalm 104, quotes, makes no reference to Israel or her history, its place in Book 4 invites us to nuance this remark. Just as Genesis 1 to 11 can't be separated from the remainder of that first book of Moses and Pentateuch, the cataphorical, forward-looking Toledot formula in uh, Genesis uh, provides cohesion to the entire book, so too we mustn't divorce Psalm 104 from the two Psalms that follow. The God of Israel, Psalm 105, is the God of the universe, Psalm 104. The creator must be obeyed, as the closing verse of Psalm 104 highlights. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. The creator must be obeyed as the closing verse of Psalm 104 highlights, the Redeemer must be obeyed, as the closing verse of Psalm 105 highlights. That they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. It is, however, the Adamic lack of obedience that needs to be remedied. The choice of Abraham and Israel on view in Psalm 105 is in the flow of Genesis set against the background of the escalation of the sin problem which reaches its paroxysm with the Tower of Babel episode, what Henri Blocher calls union in pride, the imperial sin. No element of, if you're familiar with the uh, David Klein's uh, diagram, uh, that I certainly benefited from in Old Testament 1. Um, no element of mitigation <coughs> or grace is found <coughs> in the narrative. Patently, the flood does not resolve the sin problem. You're familiar with all this. Uh, check out Genesis 9, 20 to 29. And nor does the Noahic covenant resolve the sin problem. Check out Genesis 11, 1 to 9, Tower of Babel. Is it possible that this background in the, in the first biblical book explains the implication in that concluding verse of Psalm 104? Let sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. 
Everson once again embraces a post-flood standpoint as he comments on this verse. This world is not the perfect world that was originally created, and even the world that was renewed after the flood was still inhabited by sinners. The Noahic covenant may constitute a necessary bedrock for the solution, but the solution itself must deal with sin. And that will lead us tomorrow, uh, God willing, to the twin Psalms 105 and 106. So um, I'm hoping that today's material was a, a little bit more accessible. Um, book four, leaning heavily on the Pentateuch, um, and uh, we're seeing that uh, we need a problem, a solution, a solution to the uh, problem of Genesis 3, and that lies with Genesis 12. We need a solution to the problem of sin that lies with the Abrahamic covenant. That is what is set forth uh, in book four, as we have been studying thus far. Uh, well, thank you very much, James. Uh, definitely a lot in that lecture to uh, stimulate and to think about. Uh, once again, James will be taking questions in a moment, but uh, like yesterday, I think a useful thing to do uh, would be just to take a minute to turn to the person next to you, have a little chat, and uh, help each other to formulate any questions uh, that you might have in a nice, sharp, tight way. Take a moment. OK, let's uh, pull it together. Lovely to hear so much rumbling of discussion throughout the room. And uh, like I said previously, morning tea, fantastic opportunity to continue that uh, with each other. But um, uh, do we have any questions for James? Uh, we have one at the back, Archie. Where are our microphone rovers? Two up the back here on the right. Tom? So Archie then Chris. Thank you, James. Um, uh, I just like your comment on an idea which has only begun to form in the course of your presentation today, so it may well be wrong. That is that you said that the problem, seeming problem with the Davidic covenant is answered by going back to the Abrahamic covenant and looking forward to the new covenant. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to work out, is there any place for the content of the Sinai covenant? And my thought is, from what you've said, could it be there is a non-reciprocal relationship between the blessings and the cursings? That is, in Book 4, you get the cursings uh, explained. That is why uh, Israel is going into exile. But the promise of the blessings then looks forward to the new covenant. So I'm just interested on your thoughts on that. Thank you, Archie. I should uh, mention briefly that I will uh, repeat the question, possibly condensed, for the live stream, and then hand over to James to answer. Uh, so Archie's asking the question, essentially, uh, James, you made the point that uh, we have the context of the Sinaitic Covenant in Book 4 more than the content, I believe that, is that correct? Um, uh, could you expand on that in uh, light of the uh, possible non-reciprocal fulfilment of the uh, Sinaitic Covenant in Book 4? Is that okay, Archie? Yes, yeah, so it's not so much a problem with the Davidic covenant as the problem of, of sin, um, but the um, psalmist and the psalmist perception uh, in Psalm 89 that the uh, Davidic covenant is, is not being uh, fulfilled, respected by, uh, by Yahweh. And my, uh, my point is that uh, th there are, in addition to the very strongly uh, uh, unconditional expressions such as you find in, in, in Psalm 89, uh, some conditional expressions such as we're going to find later on in the, in, in the Psalter. And we're discovering that uh, in order to, to have a full orbed understanding of the Davidic covenant, you need to take account of uh, the Sinaitic conditionality. Um, with regard to another part of your question, going back uh, to uh, the Abrahamic covenant, yes, we see as the, the uh, and yes, the, sorry, that's, that Davidic conditionality is indeed tied to the Sinaitic covenant. Uh, 
But what we've seen is that we, as we go back to the Abrahamic covenant, that that has a more fundamental place and will not be threatened, ultimately, by the Sinaitic covenant. Um, this is something that's already clear in the, in the Pentateuch. It's clear in Leviticus 26. It's clear in Deuteronomy 4. It's clear in Deuteronomy 30. Uh, and the, as it were, Book 4 is saying, if you want to uh, resolve the problem of the perplexity of Book 3, you need to go back and, go back and do Biblical Theology 1. You need to go back to the Pentateuch. You need to study the Pentateuch and see that even though the Sinaitic Covenant curses were going to fall, that would not spell the end of the Abrahamic Covenant. Yeah. Chris. Thanks, James. <clears throat> I was uh, brilliantly clear and persuasive, uh, to me at least. Um, I have a question about uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 1, and the Transjordanian Covenant. Um, how much of anything turns on seeing the covenant in addition to the covenant at Horeb as pointing forwards to the section that follows as opposed to pointing backwards? It's something I've been wrestling with um, myself for a while. Yep. Thank you, Chris. So basically the question is the covenant uh, in Deuteronomy 29 and its relation to the covenant at Horeb. Yeah. I've got a... I think it's quite a long footnote on this um, that I might need to turn to in order to refresh my memory. Um, uh, let's just see if I can lay my hands on this. Um, assuming that each of the sections of the book of Deuteronomy begins with a cataphoric forward-pointing demonstrative pronoun, the one relating to this section featuring at 2869 or 29.1 in English. Um, and now a long bit in French, which I'll spare you. Um, although, although we recognize that the debate is far from settled, the validity of our remarks concerning the Transjordanian Covenant does not depend on this question. There is a supplementary covenant set up in the plains of Moab, um, 2869 Hebrew 291 English, uh, and then 29 9 to 14 Hebrew 29 10 to 15 English. Um, note the emphasis in the latter passage on today, and whether or not its content stretches back to chapter 5, it does contain significant new information relative to that of Sinai. He put his thumb up anyway. <laughs> uh, it's a question up the back here. Okay. Yep, Nick. Hi, thanks, James. Uh, I was just wondering about, um, seems like there's a couple of moments in book four where there is a, uh, an exhortation to, uh, to be obedient to the law. And I was just wondering, um, uh, even if that's not presented as a solution to the problem of Psalm 89, what do we make of those uh, little moments? I'm thinking of Psalm 103, verse 18. Okay, so in Book 4, there are calls for obedience to the law. How does that fit with uh, the overall thesis that you've been presenting? Um, I'll, I'll discuss Psalm 103, verse 18, almost certainly uh, tomorrow when, when we get to it. Um, uh, we haven't at any stage said that you can bypass obedience. Indeed, that's one of the reasons why there is so much tension um, and one of the reasons why we shouldn't read our Bibles as follows. Uh, Genesis 1 to 3, solution Genesis 12, jump to Matthew 1. Um, the Old Testament um, contains a lot of material that um, uh, sets forth the, the progressive nature of Revelation, sets forth a lot of typology, sets forth also a lot of tension that is designed to drive us forward such that we appreciate the new covenant solution in Christ all the, all the more. Uh, and we mustn't flatten all of that out. So I'm, I haven't said that uh, obedience can, can, uh, can be avoided. <laughs> 
So good, good question. Uh, just a question for the slightly slower people in the room. Um, are you able to join the dots by way of summary, just what you've said so far, how has that contributed to your original aim of um, uh, determining what is new about the new covenant relative to the Davidic covenant according to the Psalter? Can you just summarise, yeah, join the dots for us. James, could you please summarise your lecture? <laughs> He's actually asking for a summary of three lectures, if I understand uh, correctly. Um, you've done a great service to others by uh, ask, asking that question. Um, the, the answers, the, I'm, I'm not going to um, provide the uh, answer to the problems that I raised uh, on Thursday last until Friday morning. Um, but um, a very simple way of uh, of, uh, as I said yesterday, of understanding the, the key points that have been made thus far is to follow the headings. I'm not, th 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 that is, that is the, the, the essence of what I've said in both lectures, it's simply contained. It, it is as if those headings are the conclusions. I may sometimes articulate them before providing the demonstration. Um, but what we're doing is we're seeing along the way um, various relationships between covenants uh, that are coming uh, to, to the fore in the Psalter. I'm going to provide the synthesis on uh, Friday. I'm, I don't want to be drawn beyond where, where we've got to thus far. The summary for today, given that I was invited to re restrict it to, to that, uh, is, is fairly simple. That uh, when you come to book four, which is looking for an answer to the crisis of book three, the crisis of book three turns on what looks like the annulment of the Davidic covenant, the answer is given in book four, and it's an answer based on the Pentateuch, and it's an answer that turns on the Abrahamic covenant. And we see that the Abrahamic covenant deals with a problem that is more fundamental than the, than the problem that the uh, psalmist of Psalm 89 is worrying about, namely the exile. It's the problem of sin. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, always informative and interesting. Some of the issues that you raised in Psalm 90, thinking about creation, were already coming to mind from the beginning of your trip through the Psalter. Uh, and I almost asked earlier on, um, for instance, is the royal man of Psalm 8 the royal son of Psalm 2? Um, either way, how do God's intentions with creation shape the covenant theology of the early books of the Psalter? Thank you. So uh, James raised the issue of uh, creation theology in book four, but what about creation theology earlier and its part in the development of the Psalter? I'm not sure I was particularly... Um, setting forth creation theology as such, I was simply wanting to make the point that Psalm 90 harks back to Genesis 3 uh, and following. There is, there is mention of, of, uh, of Genesis 1 and 2 as well in there. But my, my point uh, in Psalm 90 is that uh, the problem of sin is to the fore. So I've not been particularly discussing creation theology there. Uh, and in as much as I was discussing it in relation to Psalm 104, it was to do with what I believe to be the Noahic covenant um, being expressed. As far as your question is concerned more directly, I'm not sure I've understood it. <laughs> well, start with a simple one. Is the royal man of Psalm 8 the royal son of Psalm 2? Um, according to Hebrews 2, I think the answer's got to be yes. Is that not right? Um, and so to what extent uh, is God's solution to the rebellion of the nations uh, against the king and Zion uh, 
uh, a solution that actually encompasses the rebellion of all creation um, and is not just within the confines of a national covenant. Oh, so all creation there meaning all human beings? Uh, I'm thinking of Psalm 8. So you're thinking of the created order? I'm thinking of the uh, scope of the dominion of the royal son slash human and how that makes us think about the the nature of the covenant slash new covenant as it's being imagined in the opening books of the Psalter. I've, I don't think I've been arguing that much that the opening books of the Psalter have been setting forth the new covenant, ex except in the, the odd places that I drew to our attention. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that what, I, what I'm presenting is really interlinking very closely with, with your issue uh, there. But we may well see how creation then comes to be enfolded uh, in the New Covenant solution none, nonetheless uh, as, we, as we move on through.